Okay. <clears throat> so I'll start out with, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll start out with uh, questions for those of you who have them. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. You can miss a quiz. Uh, generally, generally no. I mean, if you have a special circumstance, I'm happy to to hear it and and uh, work it out that way. But the way I have the, I guess I should mention this about the secret word stuff as well. My intention for when you're doing the assignments generally is. When you go into an assignment, my intention for your, excuse me, is that you, uh, what's a good one, this one? I, th I think what I'm having a lot of people do is I'm having a lot of people show up to lab. They open up the Vim editor, for those that get that far, and then they say, I don't know what to do, or what do I do now? Or I, they, I'm being a little bit vague, but I get the impression that what people are not doing is they're not going in here first, or there's a quiz there, so they finish the assignment, and then at the 11th hour they do the quiz. My intention is that your starting point, before you go to lab, before you... Uh, try the assignment is you come in here and you go through this content overview and do the quiz and only after you do the quiz do you do the assignment. Okay, So that's my intention of how, the, how I'd like you to be doing this because if you go through this do a little reading or at least use this stuff as a reference um, and I think it's I think I would advocate skimming it to find out which and what's in each of these in these sections and then leaving it and then try these things and as you get head scratchers either searching the web or go back to these resources to find the answer I think that's probably a good strategy to do it I don't want to say that you need to sit there and read through all this stuff use it as a, a reference but sit here and, and try and get through these things uh, successfully and also see if you generally understand what each of the items are that I bulleted here. Do you know what the bool type is? Do you know what the difference between a statement and a block is? Do you know what a Boolean expression is or a compound Boolean expression? And these are terms you can, can just put this and <coughs> copy and paste that into Google and append the term C++ uh, after it and it'll turn up all sorts of nice tutorial-like information on it. Once you do that, you take the quiz. Uh, again, the, the quiz is not me trying to have a big gotcha. It's me just trying to encourage you to go to this material and give you some motivation to actually learn this stuff before you come to lab so I don't have, so I don't have to be the textbook to teach you. I, wanna, I want you to say, well, you went here, I tried this, and it's not getting it, you know, and I'm right there to help you out. Or if you, you want, well, what if I try this, that, and the other thing? I'm happy to help you explore that. I don't want you to come to lab not knowing how to do anything because you skipped all this stuff because you know I'm going to be there to bail you out. Uh, not that 
my heart isn't in it to bail you out. There just simply isn't time. It, we're still in the early part of the semester, and these problems are just going to get bigger and harder as we go on. So uh, I definitely encourage you to front load this stuff and go through it prior to uh, tackling the assignment. Also, not every lab is dedicated to simply supporting your completion of the assignment. As you've seen, I occasionally have goofy labs where I'm doing something totally different, so the lab isn't a guarantee that it's just support for the assignments, although it's for that purpose as well. So that's my little spiel on that. Um, yes, so other questions? None? Uh, I, I might need to see afterwards, but um, I was trying to do the, the graph paper for the hexagons. Yes. And for some reason, my output has a huge blank space at the top of the uh, ghost script um, page. I just uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I'd probably need to see the specific code. I don't know why it's putting a huge blank space. If you look at hexagon.h, I did add a couple header, uh, not header files, I added a couple functions, which is setting the margins, and you can play with that. I think I default it to setting a horizontal and vertical margin of half an inch, um, but you could try, I mean, you could even try putting in a negative number for those margins and see if that pulls it up. Uh, it's something to experiment with, but failing that, feel free to come to me and I'll, I'll scratch my head over it as well. Anything else? Any questions on loops? Oh, such a non-curious bunch. <laughs> yes? So with the do while loop, yes. can, you, um, can you do like do and then one statement and the while is a completely other statement and tell them is the while going on after or the while is so the, the do keyword is just a mechanism to kind of block the stuff that you want to loop. So that's the syntax of it right there. And frequently you need to stick more than one statement in here. So what you almost invariably see in code is something... That's, oops, with the while. So that's generally how you see it. And could those be conditionals? Uh, the, statements inside the, the statements inside can be anything you want. <laughs> as far as determining whether or not you're going to go back up to the top, go back here, let me, go back up to line five mm -hmm. is going to be determined by what is inside the parentheses here where I've typed this is true. So it's this right here that's a Boolean expression. It can be something as simple as a Boolean variable. So I create a Boolean variable called Todd, and I can just put Todd in there, and it'll check to see whether Todd is true or false. Or it can be some huge long thing with the, the ands and the ors, as long as A is equal to 5, and B is equal to 6, and C is not equal to Todd, and D is less than E. Uh, right? Is, and all of that will get evaluated, and it'll end up being a single true or false that the while will use to decide whether to go back up to line 5 and do the whole thing again. Your question is whether this is the actual. Well, not the actual. I'm saying it's the type of thing we would be using. But I, I was reading that a lot of web servers are written in C++. Well, uh, so you're saying a lot of Linux servers weren't written in C++. I, it, it's the, the question's a little bit too vague. So let me speak generally about. Programming. There are a lot of different programming languages out there. And um, applications that you run, Microsoft Word, Angry Birds, uh, that, that, that basically taps me out. Those are the only two I know. Um, each of those are going to be written, it could be written in any number of programming languages. Java is a very popular programming language. C++ is a very popular programming language and you will see a lot of stuff written in C++. 
If you want to talk about <coughs> an operating system, such as when you turn up turn on your computer and you either see the Linux Penguin or you see the, the Microsoft Windows icon, that is actually code that someone wrote as well, right? Those aren't, that isn't hardware, those aren't diodes and resistors that someone soldered in there, that's some code that someone wrote in a programming language. And that, of course, depends on the operating system. In the Unix, Linux world, it is going to be the C language and maybe a little bit of C++. Um, and as far as probably the single most popular language on the planet, I'll go out on a limb here and say that the C language is the single most popular language on the planet, uh, given its heritage. It's been around for a long time. The people that designed it were very, very smart and clever. Uh, they didn't even realize that they created something with such a lasting impact that 40 years later, it's as relevant as it was then. Um, but there are a lot of new things. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm wandering in my answer a little bit. But, but the, the short answer is, I would say, the Linux server, or the Linux operating system, is written mostly in C. Yes? What's your favorite language to write in? Fourth, uh, which is a language that almost no one has ever heard of. Oh. Uh, um, it's a language, it's, it's very much a niche language. I haven't done anything serious in it in over 20 years, so for me to say it's my favorite is a little bit of a cheat. It's the one that has captured my heart, my first, my first love, if you will. Um, it, it's interesting to me because it defi it's, a, it's a programming language that you use to write programming languages, which sounds weird. So this, when you're learning C++, you're learning the <coughs> if statement, right? If conditional do something, and fourth, you would actually create your own if statement. Uh, you, you generally use it to write languages to run something specific to an industry. For instance, it's very popular in astronomy. They use it to write languages for controlling astronomical telescopes and so forth. Uh, so yeah, that's mine. I'm sorry, say that again? Is that how you wrote the code for our XML program? Or no, no, no. That was in C++. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm definitely, if you, what I use day to day is C++ and Python. Those are my two choices day to day. Yes? On the do while loop, I don't know if you mentioned this, um, the difference between a do while and a while and a for. Does a do while have to run at least, or it runs at least once, right? That's absolutely correct. A while, a while statement may not run a single time. A for statement may not run a single time. A do while late statement will always run at least once. Okay. Yeah. Always once. Yes. Other questions? Yes? I notice when I like download the C++ files from the internet and then I open them on my computer, I have a Mac, so it goes straight to the Xcode. Mm -hmm. And it says that Xcode can be used to like, write apps for can you take one of the programs, like the assignment for read program, and make it applicable for your phone so I can get an app and then take the right away? So the question is, and again, I'm doing this for the benefit of the, the screen recording. The, the question is, uh, can you take the code that we're writing and put it in something like an app for your iPhone? The context being, if you just open up, if you just say open file.cpp, if you're on a Mac, it opens up this whole big programming framework, hinting that you can develop uh, phone applications. The short answer is um, yes. The long answer is a bit more complex because in order for you to put uh, what's an example of a, a simple app? Um, oh, I've, I've got an app on my phone that, that'll spit up my Google Calendar. Okay, and so it's putting out some dates and putting colored bars and stuff. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lines of code just to get these simple visuals up on, on the screen. So uh, what will normally happen is Xcode or any Program, any of the Android environments will do this too, is they bundle tens of thousands of lines of code around this before you even start your simple little thing. And unfortunately, there's a bit of a learning curve to become familiar with uh, how to use this framework. So you're not, you're not expected to develop 
you know, from the ground, the dirt, develop this application. You've got all these wonderful tools, but it does take time to learn them. The nice thing is that it's not that far out of your reach. You go through 111, 211, 311, there is a mobile programming course you can take, and you learn just that, how you can write your own apps. One of the things that you will be asked to do at the end of this semester is uh, every semester there's the capstone course runs for computer science and for uh, SINs computer information systems, where they have to do a semester-long project, and then they have to have a poster session where they actually create a, a write-up on a poster of what their application is. And a lot of times they'll have their computer, or if they do a mobile app, they'll have their mobile device there to demo it. And they have a poster session. It's traditionally been downstairs. It may be in a different room this coming semester. Anyway, uh, what I have you do as an assignment is I have you go to that poster session and you have to talk to at least three of the people and give me a little bit of write-up on three of those things. And my motivation as an instructor for doing that is for you to see all of the incredible things that you're going to be able to do one and a half, two years down the road. Um, so, yeah, th there's definitely a lot of cool stuff that you'll be able to do in this program. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to spend just a, a couple minutes talking about Vim because I have some standing questions that I never answered. Uh, does anyone have a burning question about Vim that you want to ask? Yes? So why use Vim when there's like IDs and whatnot that, in my opinion, are uh, it depends. Yeah, there are advantages to the IDs. I'm not knocking IDs. IDs are great. Uh, there's a bit of a philosophical consideration, which is how effective you can be without reaching for a mouse. Okay. And uh, I will contend that I can develop code at an extremely fast pace using Vim. Now, what if do I want to... Um, not use an IDE? My answer is no, I don't want to avoid an IDE, but what I will do is I will look for Vim bindings for that IDE. So Eclipse, you can actually get plugins that give you Vim bindings. And just about any IDE, you're going to find Vim bindings. Why? Because there are a lot of people out there like me who find that Vim is very, very efficient, very, very fast, and you get the best of both worlds where you get that fast uh, what do I want to say, tactical level code attack in Vim, and then you get the strategic benefits of having the IDE. And IDE, for those that don't know, it means integrated development environment. So our development environment is not integrated in that we're using all the tools separately. We're in an editor, we quit out of the editor. Then we compile, finishes. If there are problems, it spits the problems out, and we would have to go back in the editor, or it works, and then we run it, right? None of that stuff's integrated. An integrated development environment Generally, it's a graphical environment, and it puts it all together. And when there are errors that it appear, uh, they're, they're, they're really well suited for large applications. So if I have a 1,000 files, if some errors appear when I compile, it'll immediately open up that file and highlight the line where the error occurred. Uh, it, will, it provides nice debugging things, so you can step through your code one step at a time and see what, and interrogate values of variables to try and find where your bug is, things like that. So integrated development environments are fantastic. Um, I think you'll find them better if you know them. Yes? Um, is there a way to import, like say if you're coding on Notepad++ and import it to Vim, can you do things like that? If you're writing it on Notepad++ and importing it to Vim, uh, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't use the term import into Vim. I would say Notepad++ just creates text files. Is that correct? Does it? Do you have control over the extension that you put on the end of it, or is there always .txt? No, I think you can All right. So uh, there, there, there's no need to import. Vim is able to work on anything that's text. So create your file or find your file that was created with any sort of tool, and as long as it's text, Vim will be able to read it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So right, right. So if you've done it on your own computer and you later want to transfer it to Jaguar, absolutely, you just use FileZilla to go the other direction, dump it on Jaguar, and just say Vim file name, and there it is. Yeah. 
Yes. Would, uh, would Visual Basic be considered an IDE? Uh, yes, I would consider Visual Basic an IDE. Any other questions? Okay. So <clears throat> there are uh, your needs for Vim are starting to get a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, and one thing you're going to want to start doing in Vim is editing multiple files without leaving the editor. And an easy way for me to edit a different file while I'm in the editor is colon E, which means edit. And you just give a different name. And I am currently in a file called uh, code.cpp. This will take me to another .cpp, which doesn't exist yet. So it's this <coughs> new file. Some fancy stuff here. And now I can go back to code.cpp by colon e code.cpp. And I can go back by saying another .cpp. That's a little bit tiring to type. Uh, there's a special glyph, if you will. The pound sign means the file that I was previously editing. And the file I was previously editing was code.cpp. Now, what was the previous file I was editing? Another .cpp. So this is a nice, easy way for you to toggle between two files without leaving the editor. Uh, can you copy and paste? Yes, if you recall, YY will yank a line. Um, 3YY will yank three lines. And the unnamed buffer, the term that you're probably more familiar with, would be a clipboard. So I can say 3YY. Whoops, I accidentally said 7. 3YY, and it says three lines yanked at the bottom. Then I can edit my previous file, and I can do P for put. So that was uh, copying the three lines that were below the cursor? Including the, so that if I did 3YY, that'd be lines 4, 5, and 6. Okay. Uh, if you want to, did I ever do searching? If you want to search, it's the slash. And then the words you want to search for, or the letters you want to search for, so that finds YA. If you want to, if there are a bunch of them, let me actually, what, what is there a bunch of in here? How about the letter E? So you can see it highlights all the letters E in here. Uh, and I'm currently on that first E on line 9. If I want to go to the next one, I just I don't have to search for E all over again. I do not have to say slash E to go to the next one. I can just hit the letter N for next, next, next and, and it'll rotate back up to the top. And if it can't be found, it'll tell you that the pattern's not found. The only other uh, thing regarding searching, I'll say at this point, searching can be very incredibly sophisticated, searching and replacing can. Um, but let me just say the one thing is after you search for something, this can be visually irritating, all this highlighted stuff. And the question is, how do you get rid of the highlighting once you don't need it anymore for your search results? You can say no highlight, colon, no highlight. And that'll turn that off until you do another search. Question. Yes. On the um, the colon e pound, what was the, the syntax for that? You can do colon e space pound. No, uh, the space is optional. Okay. Uh, also, I wanted to talk about a problem that many of you are starting to encounter, And that problem goes something like this. I'm done for the day, so I am going to close my window. And then you come back a little bit later. So 
certainly if you're logged into Jaguar, that happens a lot. Oops. There we go. And I go to edit another. Oops, I go to edit another .cpp, and I get this. I'm going to shrink the text down a little bit because it's hard to see like that. Let me make it so that it's how you all probably see it. You see something like this. Does this look familiar to many of you? All right. Um, What's happening is, uh, so one of the things when you're first learning computers and you're using Microsoft <laughs> Word is you're encouraged to save often, right? Hit that, what is it, Control S or whatever it is on in the Microsoft Word world. Uh, save often. Why? Because you don't want to be typing for an hour and have either Word crash on you and you lose everything or you get a power outage and you lose everything, right? And so what Vim is doing to prevent that from being a problem is even though you haven't necessarily written out any changes, or maybe you have written out changes, but it keeps what it calls a swap file. And that swap file is basically keeping track of everything that you've done since the last time you saved. So that if the power goes out, or you forget to save and you close this window, you can get back all of those changes you made. Now the problem you all are having is you probably are saving out your file then you're closing the terminal window. The problem is you're not leaving Vim. Even though you haven't left Vim, Vim is still as a courtesy, I put use that in quotes, creating that swap file for you to recover anything that you may have lost. So what's happening is whenever I'm going into the editor using Vim, it's looking to see if that swap file is out there. And if it is out there, it's saying, hey, there's a swap file out there. Do you want to, you sure, do you want to recover from your last editing session? Uh, if you are sure that you do not have unsaved changes, you just delete the swap file. So let's find the swap file. If I do ls-a, <coughs> I can see it. Note that this file name, and that's small, let me make it bigger again. Uh, it begins with a period, which means it's a hidden file. Yes, so you don't see it with normal directory listings. If I do only put in the option to see everything, do I see it? This is the file that it's complaining about. If you know there's nothing wrong, just remove dot another dot cpp dot swp and once that file is removed then you go back into your editor and there are no problems okay uh, if you may see a bunch of these you may see swp swo uh, swn they if there are a bunch of them just get rid of all of them yes so this is a result It, po it possibly. So uh, Vim will create the swap file, right? Even if you haven't made any, usually even if you haven't made any changes, that swap file will exist. Uh, if you happen to make unsaved changes, those will be stored in the swap file. So the file's there whether or not you've made changes. But its purpose is to help you if you have made changes and you want to recover them. Now let's say that you either aren't sure whether you made changes, or you are sure that you made changes and you don't want to lose them. When I go to edit another .cpp, I use a dash R, and that means to recover the file from the swap file. And when I add that option, it says that I'm going to go ahead and use the swap file. It says this is the original file. Um, What you can do, you can look at it, and if there are no changes, then you can go ahead and quit out and remove that swap file. Let's say there have been changes, though. If there have been changes, then uh, you need to write out this file. When I try to, so make sure you write it out before you quit, and then you would remove dot another dot cpp dot swap.
I'm thinking for probably 99% of the time you all are just closing that window without quitting out of Vim and probably all you need to do is whenever you get that weird text up when you try to edit, just do an ls-a, find any swap file in here and then just remove it and you'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, so for assignment 4 we need the hexagon.h file, right, as a library? For assignment 4 you need hexagon.h and hexagon.cpp. Do I have to have that saved on my Jaguar account if that's where I'm working, or can I just save on my computer and then work on Jaguar will still access the same? It, it has to be in the same directory as your assignment for file. <laughs> so, so how do you copy it to Jaguar if you have it stored on your own computer? Yeah. Uh, you would either use Firefox or, or not Firefox, uh, FileZilla to copy them over, or I. I I think it's faster just to do it from the command line. So I would say I want to s copy hexagon dot h hexagon dot cpp, and I want to copy that I want to copy that to T Gibson at Jaguar dot CSU Chico dot edu colon. I want that to go in my assignments directory in AL4, something like that. That's how I would do the command. Any others? Actually, you could uh, remove the swap file from FileZilla. Uh, Just click, like, click, right click and delete it. FileZilla, you're, you're saying FileZilla will let you delete it? Well, that's fine. No, delete it, however. Yeah. Word of the day. Huh? Word of the day. Word of the day, um, word of the day is. There it is. Oh. That isn't it. Propitious. <laughs> the weather today is propitious for you are more inclined to go to class than to ditch. I don't know, that's a try, not a good use. Excuse me. Yes? I have a question about uh, include the string. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I deleted that program, program for very well, when I added it to work too. No. When it didn't, when you don't add string it works, and when you add string it works? Yeah. I uh, and this is for what? This is for the stoplight assignment, the uh, the assignment three. <laughs> uh, it depends. Yeah, I don't. What compiler did you do that on? On Jaguar. Yeah. Um. The first time I just had to include. Stream yeah, I, I, I don't I don't have a good answer for you. So there are, there are times. So the the question is, uh, I didn't add string and, and I was still able to use the string type, right? Is that right? And and so the the answer to the question is sometimes you include one header file and it on its own includes other header files. So I, there's an outside chance that. When you're including IO stream, it happens to be including string as well for you. Uh, if that's the if it's working fine, then that would be the case. But as a general rule, I wouldn't trust that. Whenever you need to use a string, I would include pound include string. Is there any drawbacks to have to calling redundancies? Like if IO stream calls string and then you call string. Right. So the, the question is, is there, is there any, uh, anything wrong with pound including more than once, either yourself or having it occur more than once indirectly through other include files? The answer is no. 
uh, you have to, we'll find we're actually we're not too far away from getting from working with multiple files and one of the things that I'll show you are some hoops that you have to jump through to make sure that's not a problem but it ends up it ends up being rife uh, the files include files include files and it's sometimes things would get included 20 times if you allowed it uh, it is a, it, the compiler doesn't like it so you have to jump through some hoops to make sure that the compiler is happy Hmm? Yeah, I know, that darn compiler. Don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are compilers. But um. So, uh, anything else? Yes? Change the color of Vim? Or do you, and because you have a black screen? Yeah, your solution is to go to your terminal program and find the preferences to change to a white background uh, in black text, and then it'll be fine, because you can see that the dark blue looks great on white. So that's what I'd look, look at your terminal settings, and I'd, I'd fix it that way. All right, uh, let's talk about the for loop a little bit more. You'll see this every once in a while. Yeah. Can you have a for while? Is that possible? It does this for that specific. Oh, so it's a matter of having. Uh, if the question is a matter of can you have multiple loops kind of nested together, the answer is yes, absolutely. And you'll look at some examples of that next week. But I can say. Um, How about this? Uh, see out. Do you want to see me count to three? CN answer. We will create a string ANS. Pound include string. Uh, while answer equals yes, for int i equals zero, i is less than three, add one to i, see out i potato. Um, I'll do one of them, I'll do one of them, I'll ask the question again, I'll ask it a little bit of a different way inside the loop. Uh, all right. I used to be a game designer, if you can tell. Um, don't mock my games. <laughs> All right. So quick, quick review. Well, let, let's see it run, and then, then I'll. Do you want to see me count to three? Yes. Oops. Ooh, I counted to two. Hang on. Yeah, we'll fix that bug later. Yes. Uh, Let's do it again. You want to? Yes, of course. Wow, I can't get enough of this game. All right, but eventually, <laughs> eventually you're gonna you're gonna say no. You know, when it's like time for bed or whatever. Okay. And so, <laughs> I th think I'm level eight now. I a level eight potato counter. <clears throat> Uh, so all it, there's a for loop inside of a while loop. So I will keep looping as while my answer is yes. And every time the answer is yes, I'm going to loop three times to do the potatoes. Now, help me fix this bug about the potato going 0, 1, 2. I want it to go 1, 2, 3.
I could do less than or equal to, yeah. So that's one solution. Shall we try it? Okay, that works. Uh, give me a different way. Let me. What if I leave line 11 alone? Give me a different way to do it here. I plus one. Mm. Not I plus plus. If you do, we'll try I plus plus next. But let me see. You want to see me count three? Yes, one, two, three. So that works. If I do I plus plus, what is that going to do? What does I plus plus do? All right, so let's predict the output of this program. Let me let me give some possibilities. It could do one potato, two, three potato. It could do zero potato, two potato. It could do one potato, potato, two. So here are three possibilities: one, three, zero, two, one, two. And there's my code. Let me get this comment out of the way. I'll put it up here for a moment. Shall we run it? Here we can take a vote. How many say one three? A couple. How many say zero two? A few more. How many say one two? All right. Okay, we'll see who gets voted off the island here. Zero, two. So let's see what's happening. I is being set to zero on line 20. We hit line 21. We hit line 22. We add one to I. But remember, there's a distinction here between plus plus I and I plus plus. I plus plus is going to... Both of them add one to i, but the question is, what is, for lack of a better term, given back? The old value of i or the new value of i? If the pluses come after, it's the old value. If the pluses come before, it's the new value. So the pluses are coming after, so it's the old value. So this does add one to i, and i does get increased to one on line 22, but it is going to give back the original value of i, which is zero. So we see the zero, I is now one, we get to line 23. When we hit line 23, we go to this bit right here. And this is gonna add one to I. So now I has gone from one to two. Is two less than three? Yes, absolutely, so we do another time through the loop. We add another one to I. So two turns into three on line 22, but the original value is, is given back. So it's two, even though I has been increased to three, it is two that prints out here. So we got the zero potato, two potato, comes down to 23, hops up here, adds one more to I. Now I is four. Is four less than three? No, so it bails out of the loop. And we should be able to see that by saying C out, I equals, and we can print out I. And that should be four. Whoops. Oh, it isn't going to like that for reasons that I'll defer for now. Yeah, so I did increase to four. Uh, the, the, the final thing that I'll mention that you'll sometimes see in coding is what is referred to as an infinite loop, meaning you want to write a program that is going to loop forever. And the way you do that, there are a number of ways of doing it. How, how can I make a while loop loop forever? Yeah, you could, you could just put true in there, or you could say something like that, right? That's true all the time. But don't beat around the bush. Don't be coy. Just say true. Uh, another version of an infinite loop is if you leave all that information completely empty, that actually is an infinite loop. And then you know, do while, of course, you just do something similar to what you have in line 10 there. So with that, uh, we will see you on Monday.